Hello, and welcome to the next webinar of the series of the Pathways to Promotion Committee of the American Statistical Association Statistical Consulting Section. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel, so it will be available if you have to drop off early. Our webinar today is entitled Maintaining Meaning and Value to Address uh, Burnout. Before we get to our webinar, I would like to provide a little, a little information about this section on statistical consulting, as well as the American Statistical, statistical Association resources that may be of interest to our audience. The first is a section on statistical consulting. This is a community of statistical practitioners across a variety of diverse disciplines, and the section offers a variety of resources which may be useful to you. Here is the information on that. The other resources and opportunities include the Pathways to Promotion subcommittee of the Statistical Consulting section, the Academic Statistics Consulting Center Hangout, the Collaborative Healthcare Networking Group, and the Meetup for Statistical Consultants. Please contact the person listed to get more information or to be included in these activities with meeting invites. The Pathways to Promotion Committee is a subcommittee of the section on statistical consulting and its mission is to develop the recommendation and tools to help the advancement of collaborative academic statisticians. And if you're interested in joining, please contact our chair, Margaret Stedman. I also want you to be aware of the other webinars that the Pathways to Promotion Committee has facilitated. These are housed on our YouTube play page. So please like and subscribe if this is of interest to you. You can use the QR code or the web, take a screenshot and navigate to the website. So today we'll start with each speaker's presentation and I will go ahead and introduce each speaker prior to their presentation. Then we'll provide time for Q&A from the audience using the Zoom chat feature. Please note the chat moderators. Um, if you would prefer to submit your question anonymously, you can submit a direct question to them and then they can um, work to uh, send that on your behalf. So before I introduce the speakers, I wanna provide a little context and understanding about why we think burnout is important in the Pathways to Promotion Committee. So I think we think the point needs to be made that we are all in this together and that burnout is not an isolated issue, but it's pretty universal. It's not a reflection of the self, but of the environment in which we find ourselves. And so burnout has, has been discussed, but it has not been discussed in the statistical community. And aspects of our profession provide many opportunities and situations which may foster burnout. So for those experiencing burnout, you are more likely to take a sick day and more likely to require emergency medical care. Employees experiencing burnout are less likely to ask for constructive feedback, are less confident in their job performance, and are three times more likely to leave their jobs. Um, so this is a topic that's important to everyone, employees, managers, and other leaders. In this webinar, we hope to address the following through the Q&A and through our speakers' wisdom and strategies to recognize burnout, how we can prevent and address burnout, and how you can make a change if you are experiencing burnout. So again, please submit any questions at any time during the presentation using the Zoom chat feature. And a quick reminder that we will have an open Q&A session following the speakers, and I will facilitate that. You can send your questions directly to our chat mod uh, moderators, uh, Terry Vasilopoulos, or Xiaoming Sing Sheng, who can um, help uh, send those questions on your behalf. So with that, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Emily Leary, and I'm an assistant professor and the director of orthopedic biostatistics at the University of Missouri. And I'll be the facilitator for today's webinar. So it is absolutely my pleasure to welcome our first speaker today, Dr. Tara Madala, the founder and CEO of Pandora BioE. Dr. Madala, began her career as director of biostatistics at Clinometrics and then joined Genomic Health Inc., becoming direct, senior director for clinical biostatistics. She jo joined Grail Inc. as vice president 
for biostatistics, data management, and biosample operations, where she was a founding team member and built a group of 35 statisticians, clinical scientists, clinical data scientists, clinical data managers, and biosample operations managers. In 2021, she joined Delphi Diagnostics as VP of Clinical Development, and in 2022, was chaired their scientific advisory board. Then in late 2022, she founded Pandora Bio Inc. and serves as the Chief Executive Officer. Welcome, Dr. Madala. Thank you. Um, all right, let me share my screen. Thanks for the introduction. Um, okay. Okay. So hi, everyone. I'm Tara, um, and I'm uh, not just um, founder of uh, Pandora Bio, which is a mental health startup, but also um, a, a consultant. So I consult several days a week still um, as a statistician. So I have some perspectives on like the consulting environment now, especially, um, you know, through COVID and after COVID. So if you have questions about that and, you know, balancing workplace stress as a consultant, I'm happy to answer those kinds of questions. But I want to thank the organizers for inviting me today um, to speak. And when I was thinking about the topic of burnout, I was thinking, what do we mean by the term burnout? And um, Emily already stated it really well. It's about um, burnout is the um, is the symptom, but stress is the actual underlying cause. Um, and there are many times when I felt overwhelmed, um, but I was wondering, is that the same thing? So, um, so to state again, burnout is the symptom, stress is the source. And there are many causes uh, that, that I like Googled, <laughs> heavy workloads, toxic relationships, um, unfair treatment, lack of role clarity or uh, heavy time pressures. So I guess, I want you to maybe I'll take a pause and, you know, have you guys all think about what kinds of thoughts come up for you when you think about work and you think about these causes. So I'm going to pause for maybe 10 seconds. Um, okay. And so, you know, the other thought I had was that I've mentored several folks over the years whose confidence in themselves was eroded because they, what they perceive to be maybe a toxic work environment. Um, and I think, again, um, Emily stated it really nicely about some, it's not necessarily about the individual, but sometimes it's about the environment, right? So fit with the org. Um, and um, when you think about burnout, you think about, I, I've thought about people who've maybe left their positions and needed a break and not necessarily because of only this um, heavy time, these heavy time pressures, but also maybe, um, you know, the environment itself. So when I look at these different, like heavy workloads, toxic relationships, and so forth, I come up with a couple of things, a um, couple of examples of when I felt stressed. And when I feel stressed, it's because I don't feel valued. So a couple of examples from my career is, for example, lack of role clarity. I've worked in the genomic diagnostic space for over 15 years. Um, and oftentimes there are a lot of data scientists and engineers um, with, without statistical training, yet they're accountable for deliverables that require statistical thinking. And so in those situations, at times when I've been told to like maybe stay in my lane, I've become quite frustrated because um, that, 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 you know, lack of role clarity when uh, I have something to contribute led to stress. So that's one example. Another is time pressures. You'll all probably relate to this. Um, statisticians are oftentimes the ones who have to do the analysis at the very end. So you're nearing the end of a project. Invariably, the timeline gets um, pushed out, 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 but the deadline never moves, right? We all know that there's that presentation that's due to, you know, the investors or the presentation at a conference or a publication that's due. And, and uh, no matter what, that timeline doesn't move and our timeline gets scrunched. So there's obviously frequently heavy time pressures. Um, so I'm just thinking about like the times when I've felt maybe undervalued in these kinds of situations. Um, and so I wanted to like, like um, talk a little bit more about this environment idea. So do folks, I, I can't see everyone, so I'm just gonna, <laughs> uh, but I don't know if folks recognize this painting, um, but this is a painting called the Vinegar Tasters. 
Um, and we see here three men standing around a vat of vinegar and each has dipped his cup into a vinegar, the vinegar and tasted it. And the expression on each man's face shows his individual reaction. Um, and this is a painting that represents the three teachings of China and the vinegar they are sampling represents the essence of life. So here we see Confucius, Buddha and Lao Tse and uh, Confucius has a sour look on his face. Um, Buddha has a bitter expression and Lao Tse is smiling. And um, Confucius saw life as sour and need of rules to correct the de uh, degeneration of people. Um, Buddha saw life as bitter, dominated by pain and suffering due to attaching possessions. Um, and then Lao Tse, from the Taoist point of view, saw sourness and bitterness come from the interfering and unappreciative mind. So um, life, so life itself, when understood and utilized for what it is, is sweet. So I show you this. Um, to illustrate that no two people see things the same way. And what's sweet to one may be bitter to the other, um, wait, which may be sour to the next. And I show you this to say, know yourself. So I've said many times, I feel lucky that I get to do what I love, do what I love doing. Um, and it, a lot of times it doesn't feel like work. Um, and it's a reflection of one of my favorite quotes. So I'm going to show you my favorite quote. Luck is where preparation meets opportunity. And um, I want to share with you what I mean by preparation and opportunity later, but let me let me share with you a little bit about my journey. So out of school, I worked at a CRO. Um, CROs aren't considered necessarily the most glamorous jobs, but I, I had and I had an offer from like a much bigger um, pharma uh, company, but I chose the CRO because it was small. My manager at the interview said, we're going to do great things together. Um, and and we did. Over six years, I worked for 20, more than 20 clients across six therapeutic areas. I filed a couple of NDAs and um, we multiplied our revenue and grew the department. And that move led to explosive career growth that in 2006, I joined uh, what was a startup at the time, Genomic Health, um, at the forefront of personalized medicine. Um, and GH, Genomic Health had incredible mentors and managers. It was a unicorn, not by today's standards. Today's standards is a $1 billion valuation, but it was a unicorn in the culture. So they truly put patients first. And organizationally, um, the statistics department was considered like the crown jewel of the organization and really valued. The, organ the That department itself was valued. And then a decade later, I joined another startup. Um, this time, I won, uh, it was a unicorn in terms of $8 billion valuation in less than five years. But again, here I learned so much about science and computing and business. And then again, um, five years later, joined Delphi Diagnostics, where we um, launched the company at the start of COVID. So again, it was um, about learning how to build a team, keeping them engaged, keeping them in, you know, engaged in this fully remote environment. Um, so you must have heard me say the word learn like several times when I was talking about my career path. And the point being that um, I realized what I learned about myself is that I love learning. Um, and that was important to me. And I also found that what was important to me was that I liked a smaller company and that, um, I liked fast pace and I liked ambiguity and mentoring and, um, that my manager, who my manager was at these different companies was important to me. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I learned about my values for what kind of environment I would thrive in. And now I have two businesses and I get a chance to, um, you know, share my values with the uh, companies that I, that I work in now um, that I manage and I get to um, do what I love at these companies. Um, so Luck is where preparation meets, meets opportunity. Remember that quote. Okay, so preparation. What do I mean by preparation? Know yourself. So the same situation is not right for everybody. You know, do you, are you more comfortable in a, as a big fish in a small pond, a small fish in a big pond? Um, do you like a place with lots of structure or do you like a place with um, ambiguity? Are you comfortable with change? Are you a lifelong learner? Do you need an environment in which they encourage lifelong learning? Um, do you have a set of values that you feel very strongly about? And do your values align with the company values? Um, 
And, uh, you know, think about these kinds of things, like what environment would you thrive in? And because we would all, we all excel in a place where we're most comfortable and where it suits us. And then when I think about opportunities, then come the opportunities, right? Is, um, I always say pick a manager because there are opportunities across a company, but where, if you have a manager who has influence within the organization, then you're more likely to get those opportunities. Um, <clears throat> and then also how much um, do does your manager care about the people that, that are working on their team? And are they good at teaching? Are they good at motivating? Um, your happiness and growth and your stress and ability to um, be transparent with your manager are dependent on those opportunities and your relationship with your manager. Um, so let me let me sh sh uh, show you what I mean about um, about the the preparation opportunity, and then really about like how to show your value at an organization. So I'll give you an example um, of something from Genomic Health. Okay. I'm going to ask, I, I like to ask this question. What do, do these two have in common? Um, one is a cartoon man and one is my, my little guy, Teddy. Any, any hands? I can't tell if I can, can we just maybe use the chat box? Anyone take a guess? And I recognize one person on this call who can't answer because I think they've seen this before. <laughs> no guesses? Am I missing the guesses? There's one in the chat box, living beings. They have nothing in common. Okay. Mammals. Okay. All right. Great. We have some. Okay. They have hair. They're both males. Yes. Okay. Eyes. Yes. All these are correct. So <laughs> creatures who want something from us. I like that one. <laughs> That's a great one. I've never gotten that one before. Um, <laughs> they both look confused. <laughs> um, all right. What I was looking for is they both have a prostate. Okay, so why do I say that? Okay, I'm going to give you the case study of the genomic health uh, oncotype prostate score um, test. I worked there for a decade. This was my uh, fifth baby, I guess. I have three kids, the dog, and then this is <laughs> this is the prostate test. <laughs> Um, the problem is that 200,000 new prostate can uh, men get diagnosed with prostate cancer every year. 90% um, of those men are diagnosed with localized prostate cancer. So they have nearly 100% chance of living five or more years. Yet the majority of those men do get treated with either surgery or radiation. And that treatment leads to a high rate of incontinence and impotence. So the question for these men is if... Um, it is to determine the aggressiveness of their disease so that it helps them make a decision whether they should just to decide whether they should get immediate treatment or active surveillance, which means that they can um, wait to get their treatment so they don't have to suffer these side effects. And um, recall, like statistics was included in many, many of the decisions at, at Genomic Health and to um, from the very beginning in terms of designing the studies that formed the basis for the clinical evidence that led to um, the product launch. And so I'm not gonna go through all these studies, but briefly there were several studies that were designed um, in conjunction with medical, but through the statistics group. And we had lots of questions to ask along the way, you know, can we evaluate the population, the intended use population with these study designs? Do we need to look at surrogate endpoints? Is the event rate rare? Can we use retrospective cohorts? Cause we can save time by not enrolling prospectively. And even then are the cohorts that we have retrospectively rare, right? So we had to make a series of decisions um, and there were implications to, to each of these decisions. But in the end, what we were able to do was show our value as a collaborator within this organization. So we were able to save in terms of size going from 2000 um, patients in a study without a statistician with to 450 with having a statistician. Um, we were able to save in time, several years in time to run the studies, save um, hundreds of thousands of dollars of cost because we used retrospective samples. And then our reputation also, you know, the algorithm that we developed, um, the that the team developed and the product uh, launched in 2013. So it's, you know, stood the test of time. So really showing the value of the statistician 
um, and what you do in the organization as it translates to time, cost, and reputation, I think can really help. Um, so what I would say is find situations where you can contribute over the lifetime of the project, You have where you have visibility into the strategy for the company or the lab with whom you're consulting. Um, the role, you know, find situations where the role of the statistician is considered critical, and if not, educate them on why it would be critical. Um, and become an expert in at least one statistical practice area that gives you leverage to provide, you know, input um, more easily, and also they will see your value. And then choose a manager or collaborator who you can have transparent conversations with um, about your own values and your career aspirations. And I'll leave you with one of my other favorite quotes, which is go where you're celebrated and not merely tolerated. If the environment's not right for you, then you should try to find something that is right. Um, okay, I said I, would, I lied. Okay, one final thought. <laughs> Don't work for the pointy haired boss. So pointy haired boss, Wally, did you finish the analysis for tomorrow? Wally, no. I'm waiting until the last minute so you won't have time to ask for unnecessary changes pointy-haired boss. I'm one step ahead of him. The analysis itself is unnecessary. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Medalla. Um, let's see. So our next speaker today is Dr. Sally Morton. Um, she is the Executive Vice President of Arizona State University's Knowledge Enterprise which is responsible for the university's research and economic development ecosystem. Dr. Morton's career has spanned both higher education and industry, including being Dean of the College of Science at Virginia Tech, Chair of Biostatistics at the University of Pittsburgh, Vice President for Statistics and Epidemiology at RTI International, and Head of the RAND's, RAND Corporation Statistics Group. Dr. Morton was the 2009 president of the American Statistical Association and received the Norwood Award for Outstanding Achievement by a Woman in the Statistical Sciences in 2017. She currently serves as the Board of Scientific Counselors for the National Center for Health Statistics, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute Methodology Committee, and the Research Advisory Committee of the National Collaborative on Gun Violence Research. Welcome, Dr. Morton. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, see if I can do this. Okay, can we see the screen? Wonderful. And I apologize if I had to go off video. I lost co connectivity just a few minutes ago. So first, I'd like to thank the organizers and uh, uh, Tara for such a wonderful talk. I'm delighted to be here and thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, I think Tara really struck the nail on the head, go where you're valued. That's a wonderful piece of advice. So let me start with kind of first things first. The first is to really acknowledge that burnout is real. Uh, we're not here to fix ourselves instantaneously today. I hope all of us go away with a couple, maybe a few things that we could do to reduce burnout among ourselves and also reduce it among others. Um, I think it's really important to make sure that it's not a, um, a deeper issue like depression. So please be mindful of getting a diagnosis if it is something that really lasts for a long time. Today, I'm really gonna focus on leaders and leadership how as leaders and managers, because that's the role I find myself in now, we can really do a, a better job to support our fellow uh, colleagues in the workplace. So the first thing as a leader, I really try to uh, model the behavior that I hope will support others. I always say that as a leader, uh, people are our only currency. I work now, I head research at ASU, as you heard, I have a lot of buildings, a lot of expensive equipment, but fundamentally people are our only currency. Uh, be aware that you yourself can experience burnout as a leader. And so it's important to be aware not only of those that you're leading and managing, but yourself as well. 
So Tara spoke a little bit about what attracts her to certain jobs. And this is one of the questions that came up that we were, many of you sent in prior to the webinar. I think for me, it's all about mission. On this slide, it's the charter of Arizona State University. We are defined by whom we include and not whom we exclude and how they succeed. And we do research of public value accountable to the communities that we serve. So I always try to go to places where the vision and mission align with my personal values. Uh, during COVID, I was a dean at Virginia Tech, and it was a very difficult time in terms of communication. And I was out for a long walk, which is what I did during COVID to relieve stress. And I went by a garden, and a small child had written a sign. It said, hope. And I thought to myself, I want to lead with honesty and hope. And I ended every conversation that I had with faculty, staff, and students. I would say, your health your family's health, and our community's health as our primary concern. So thinking about how you lead, how you inspire, and how you communicate is very important. Work as a team and lean on others, and I'll say more about that in a moment. So really try to focus on open, openness and consistency. It's important to bring in people who know about stress and burnout and learn from them yourself as well as provide that knowledge uh, to your team members. For example, this webinar could be a resource that you might share with those that you lead. It's important to make clear uh, to your employees how they can get help if they need it. So you probably have an employee wellness program. Make sure that's kind of front and center. Provide avenues for people to speak. I always say as a leader, when people are talking, I'm never worried. It's when they're silent that I start to worry. So you need to make sure that people feel they can speak up and say, this is stressful. What are our priorities? Should we revisit them? And speak not only directly to you, but perhaps have anonymous ways to speak as well. Tara made clear that clarity is very important. As a manager, one of the stresses that you can put on your employees is that they're not clear on what the expectations are. How do you get tenure? It should be very clear to people what the expectations are. I believe that that reduces stress as well. And I put no there. I had a, a colleague at the Rand Corporation who heard that I used to work there who was always saying yes. And I gave him an index card and it said no. And I put it on his desk and I said, remember, this is an option that you can take. Uh, and I am behind you as your leader to say no. And I, in this way, as I was encouraging him to be able to say no. Now it's more complicated than that. And many of your questions were about how to say no. I personally believe a no early is much better than a sort of, yes, maybe I'll get to it. And then two weeks from now, someone's depending on you to do the work. You haven't been able to do it or you only do a halfway job. You are put both yourself as well as the person you're working with in a more difficult situation. So very important to allow people to say no and help them learn how to do that in a way that's collegiate uh, and constructive and that they don't feel they're being put on. So revisit priorities. That's very important as a leader. We do that all the time in my current job. What are we doing that we actually should stop if we're gonna take on other responsibilities. So I thought I'd think about some very practical things that you can do as a leader and also as an individual. Control email. I never send email outside of work hours, particularly I have over 2000 staff. I never send an email outside of work hours. I think it indicates to them, unless it's that a building is burning down, which we have actually had. In those cases, an emergency, I do send an email. But otherwise, it's a way to show them that you value and respect their out of office time. Set boundaries, take vacation yourself. Every week an email goes out to my 15 direct reports telling them what my schedule is for the coming week. The reason that I do that is they very often can say to me, Sally, you're meeting with so-and-so. I met with him last week. 
and here's some information you might want to know. But when I am taking vacation, that schedule says Sally is taking vacation. It is in that way that I empower them to take vacation and take personal time as well. Hybrid work environment is very important. Uh, we have extensive commutes here in Phoenix and allowing people to work at home just gives them a break. Celebrate your employees. Uh, professional development, that's incredibly important. Uh, when I was coming up as a statistician, I tried to set aside time each week to actually read literature in my area. That was on my calendar. Model that and empower that and make sure that people know that you value their development. Uh, that can often be much more important than awards that you give and celebrations, that they see a path to move forward. Teach and learn, I've already said that. As get a group together. We had a set of deans that talk together, people at your level so you can learn from each other. What you can do as an individual, first of all, ask yourself, are you okay? How is burnout affecting you? Early in my career, I decided I'm not superwoman. Okay, I just decided I wasn't. Uh, I had children, I had to care for them. I allowed myself grace. And by that, I mean an opportunity to set my own path, what was important to me as an individual in my family and other responsibilities that I had, it just allowed myself grace. If you can do that for yourself, I think that will, that will really support you. I have a support network of mentors, uh, friends, colleagues that I use. I've already talked about vacation. I commute cards. This is a little trick that I used when I was a new mother. As I was coming into work, I had an index card in the car. And it just, it, it had points that I wanted to focus on at work. It allowed me to switch persona from mother to work. And then when I was going back home, I had an index card, the baby's teething, it's gonna be difficult tonight. You know, don't, don't worry about things, you're doing a good job. It was my way to just kind of switch and it kind of helped me. Uh, the 80-20 rule, generally you get about 80% of the job and the first 20% of the effort, it doesn't have to be perfection. Get to the best you can and move on. No connectivity. I try to take hours in the day where I'm not looking at email, not looking at the screen, just take a break, get enough sleep, have your hobbies, your exercise, uh, read trashy novels, do whatever it is to try to allow yourself to take a break. Um, I don't mean for these to be facetious or in any way patronizing to you, but think about those practical things that you can do to give yourself a break and model them for those of you that, that you lead. One last thing, think about what matters to you. Um, on this slide, you see two tweets of mine from last year's joint statistical meetings. The one on the left is a crazy bunch of open water swimmers. And I think I actually saw Sandra McBride having joined today's webinar. She was the leader of this. We've begun the open water statisticians. And in any event, whatever it is, that, that you like to do, maintain that. On the right is a picture of myself and a fledgling statistician who's related to me, my daughter, who was actually at the joint staff meetings. So whenever somebody asks me, what do you do? I don't say I'm an executive vice president, blah, blah, blah. I say I'm a mother and a grandmother and a spouse and a daughter and a sister and a friend. That's what's most important to me. So think hard and, and Tara really put this in the context of being a statistician. And I loved hearing about the work that she's done and how she's found her place and what, what gives her strength and opportunity. So I think I'll close there because I'm really interested in your questions and the discussion. Please take care of yourself and take care of each other. And my contact information is given there as well as my Twitter account, please follow me. And uh, I'd be happy to talk with you offline if that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation today, Dr. Morton. I am going to try to share my screen.
we go. Um, so now we're going to start with the Q&A session. So to get discussion going, um, I thought it would be nice. I think a lot of, uh, we have a lot of people in the audience. It might be nice to put any resources that have been helpful to you um, in the chat so that others may benefit from, um, from uh, your perspective and your experience. And so reminder, if you have questions, please submit them in the chat. And I'm gonna try to see if I can find, all right. Okay, so let's start with um, a first question. Um, and either speaker should feel free to to address this, but um, do you have strategies for boundaries to avoid working nights and weekends for maintaining uh, vacation time? What and what do you do to do that? I don't I don't think I'm good at that. So I'm going to let Sally answer that one. Oh, no, I'm not so sure I'm good at it either, but thank you. Um, I do think it's terribly important to do. Uh, and it's important to do from the beginning when you start working with people so that they understand that that's what you're doing and that is the expectation. Otherwise they get used to the amount of productivity that you're able to do in 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So I'm pretty uh, direct about it. Um, I'm, I, I share it with people that, that I work with. I'll give you some examples. I happen to be an early morning person. I get up quite early, but about from 6 p.m. on, on the weekdays, I'm not working unless there is a crisis. And again, as I shared, I too occasionally have buildings blowing down or laps blowing up or something like that that I have to pay attention to as because of my position at the university. But I'm clear with people from about 6 p.m. on, um, I won't be reading email. I'll be back on at 5 a.m. And that's, that's kind of the break because I really think sleep is important. So just set those boundaries, be firm about them. Um, I, when I had small children at home, I didn't actually work on Sundays and I was very clear with people that that was family time. It's difficult to do, particularly when you're early career and you feel that you might be judged, uh, and then if you don't work as hard, it could reflect on promotion and so on. But just really do it and try to be open about it with your managers and others that you work with. Maybe I'll, I'll change that question around a bit um, because, like I said, I don't I don't know if I'm good with the boundaries, but I am good at sharing what my working style is. So I'm not like a nine to five or eight or six to <laughs> six to six, right? I um, have to feel energized when I feel energized to work. And I want to like, so I live in Sunnyvale, California, and it's oftentimes really great. The weather's, it's really cold in the morning, really cold. It's cold in the morning in California and it's cold in the evening. So in the middle of the day, when it's really great, I want to go on a bike ride or I want to go play tennis and, or I want to, you know, just sit outside and, you know, read a book or whatever. And so what I would do is I would be clear that like I, when I was leading, for example, when I was at Delphi and I was, I was leading a, a large department, I would actually have my calendar be completely transparent. And I put in there a two hour bike ride in the middle of the day to encourage other folks, like if they're not, you know, if they want to be, have that kind of flexible schedule too, to make it clear to them that that's okay too, right? Like if that's the way you like to work, then, um, you know, feel free to block out two hours for, you know, exercise or what, you know, getting out with the kids or whatever you need to do. Um, because uh, I guess, so the, in a way, that's my way of setting boundaries is to say that my working style is this flexible working style and then making it clear to everyone that, that that's okay to do. And, and back to Sally's point, it's easier to do that when you're later in your career. Um, I think when you're earlier in your career, blocking out calendar time on, for everyone to see um, can be um, intimidating. But again, that's why as a leader, I encourage that night 
you know, encouraged everyone at any level to be doing that. Excellent. Thank you. Um, this next question, I think, is important, um, particularly in um, with with our speakers, is people who are underrepresented minorities or minorities in other aspects. Um, I think that some of those characteristics can contribute to burnout. Do any of our speakers have any suggestions on how to address those to prevent symptoms of burnout and feelings of um, not being a part of things? Can you share the first part of that question again um, to address what? Yeah, so I, th I think a lot of people experience, you know, microaggressions or sort of um, overt um, sense of not belonging, being an underrepresented minority, a female in a male dominated um, space. Um, so I wonder if you could speak to that, um, because those types of experiences can lead to burnout. Um, um, I think, I think, I think that's also related maybe to a question on, on the chat, right? Um, it's, uh, I have experienced those things, um, and it does lead to frustration, much like the, the work-related frustration, like I was talking about with like having to stay in your lane and, you know, statistical expertise. Um, they're all frustrations that can build up over time. Um, I think the ways that I've dealt with that is to actually talk to my manager or, or someone else like HR in those cases. And oftentimes if an HR representative I've, I've had I've had a few HR representatives who've been very helpful in those situations um, with strategies. Oftentimes, some HR folks can be like therapists. They can actually help you in that way, you know, with like um, with the interactions with with some of the other folks. So I would say, you know, talking to HR and then also getting um, getting support from your manager. Thank you. I think that's that's a great suggestion. Um, I would say two things in response to this. First, uh, when I was a dean and more working uh, directly with uh, faculty and as a chair, there's a concept of something called third shift work, which means there's first shift, you know, you're on this committee in the, in the group and you have to teach these courses and so on that everyone has to do. Second shift, generally women are doing, taking care of children at home and and family and so on. Third shift, whereby uh, particularly women of color are have to take on advising all the students of color in the department, despite those students having official advisors, but the students coming. So there's this sh third shift work, which isn't taken in into account in one's promotion and so on. And there's actually been efforts at several universities to clarify this type of work and make sure that it is counted and, take, and one receives credit for it. So the one thing I would uh, recommend for those in leadership is to really think hard about how work, for, I'm talking about the academic setting now, is actually portioned across faculty and is it truly valued? So I think as leaders, uh, we have the ability to actually change structures and processes that uh, produce a more equitable setting. Uh, for the individual, I, I did get frustrated over my career, um, uh, feeling that people were expecting me to work all hours, as we spoke about a few minutes before, not being given credit for work, not being credited in meetings and so on. I tried to find my way to colleagues who I felt I was valued by, to go back to Tara's opening set of comments. That isn't always easy to do, but really ask yourself the question, are you in the right place, working with the right people in the environment that, where you feel valued? And if you're not, think about making a change. And I know that's, that's not easy to do again, or band together with others within that environment to try to make a change. I want to tack on, thank you, Sally. I want to tack on to your idea about the third shift work. That's a great point. Um, we see all that, we see that also in industry. There are lots of culture committees and, um, you know, all these different committees, uh, 
to 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 um bring um you know more of the softer side of the company together and oftentimes women are the ones who are leading those efforts and also volunteering for those efforts so um at one company i worked at as leaders we said that we wanted to get an equal gender or you know balance in in those committees so again as leaders trying to promote those kinds of opportunities um, more equitably um, makes sense. So I love that you brought that up. I also noticed in the chat that someone noted that there's more women, though I can't see everyone here on this webinar, than men. And what does that indicate? Are, are more women experiencing burnout than men? I have absolutely no idea on the statistics or evidence on that, but an interesting observation by someone joining us today. So as a follow-up to that, we've had, a, it, it seems like there's this sort of sense of community, which could lead to burnout, but but also a sense of community um, can help with it. So how do you strike that balance and how do you build community with remote work becoming the norm in, in different areas for statisticians? Wow, that's a great question. I, I would actually add another layer to that, um, which is that a lot of younger or more early career folks who are starting working in during COVID, um, that would even be more challenging because, you know, when if I think back to my career, I went into the office and when I went into the office, then I also I was able to um, see how others um, were more productive in a work environment, learn from others in real time. And that's how I learned. Um, and in this remote work environment, those, those um, folks who are just starting out their careers, they don't have that opportunity to uh, learn in real time and observe others. Um, so I don't know if I have an answer for you <laughs> about the community. I was just layering on an additional, like, I think, challenge that um, folks who are just starting their careers might also be facing, but um, maybe maybe I'll let Sally maybe comment on that if you have any ideas, and then I'll comment again after you've done so. Well, the sense you you raise the hybrid or telecommuting completely and in person completely environment that's something we're struggling a, a little bit with in the in the academic context because the students I think uh, rightfully uh, expect an in-person environment, but how do you balance, uh, particularly with staff? For faculty, their calendars are more clear. They come in to teach, to advise, to work in the lab, and then can go home. Their hours are more flexible. But asking people to come in from eight to five to sit and do finance is terribly important in the area of the, of the university that I run, where they're not student-facing and they want to have the ability to, to telecommute. So we kind of balance that hybrid environment and, and still the point that Tara made, making sure that particularly new uh, employees are given enough of that in-person help, structure, supervision, if you will, before they start out more telecommuting. Going back to the community, I'm actually so excited as a statistician who's been working for 35 years in the discipline to see all these communities sort of um, being created like, like the one we're part of today and, and to see committees uh, like uh, the, well, the statistical consulting section and then this uh, committee of the section really providing that community. But I could see how if one did too many of these, they take up so much time and, and really energy, they could be problematic as well. Um, I used to always advise mentees to think of the old um, mailboxes, you know, where there are certain boxes you could put letters in. And I sort of said, make sure there's a letter in each box, but they're not packed full. And what I meant by that is sort of decide how much you're gonna give to each activity in your career, writing papers, involved in the professional society and so on, um, and really go in with your eyes open. So it, it's a delicate balance, but I can tell you as a, uh, a statistician who's closer to the end of her career than the beginning, I'm actually delighted to see the support that we're providing each other, particularly for women and people of color, um, having grown up in the discipline where there are very few women just to start with, 
35 years ago, then it's just wonderful to see the support that we're giving each other. If I reflect on the um, experience most recently at Delphi, which was what I said um, it, when I was talking about the path, it's it started during COVID. We were all remote and we continued to be remote because we hired during a period where it didn't matter where people were living. And so um, one way that we created community was to have these offsites, these virtual offsites that were really focused on having fun and getting to know each other as opposed to work. And then we'd have regular meetings where we shared where I shared the overarching strategy for the company and for our group and under, so that everyone understood the priorities and why we were doing, we were, each of us was doing what we were doing. Um, but then that gets to the flip side, which is too many meetings and feeling burned out from not having enough time to do your work. And so there has to be the right balance between the two. But um, I do get the sense that whenever there is an offsite, either in person or virtually, there is a, a newfound sense of energy and um, community, which can really be helpful and can um, can last. I, I think that's great. Or uh, when we do those as well, we find that, that energy um, revitalized and often get some great suggestions uh, from, uh, for example, I recently had one and there was a very important suggestion about how to improve communication, which we implemented, and I think has been really useful to everyone. But one of the points that Margaret made in the chat about identifying burnout among um, colleagues that you don't see who are working at home, that's a really, really difficult people feeling so isolated, hard to know how to help with that. But to be mindful of it, I think is important. It's a great point. Um, so I, I'm going to take the, some of the questions in a different direction with more uh, leadership promotion focused as Pathways to Promotion Committee. For many people preparing to take on a different role or, or moving from, um, you know, more of a leadership role, how can they best um, manage things or prepare to prevent burnout? Well, maybe I'll start, Tara. So thinking, and I'll, I'll focus in particular on, on getting tenure or promotion within the academic ranks. I think the most important thing is to understand what the expectations are very clearly from the get-go, even on the first day that you begin as an assistant professor. Understand very clearly, and the chair should be able, or director of your group should be able to tell you this, um, and you should ask this actually when you interview. If they are unable or unwilling to tell you this, this may not be a job that you want. I think when the expectations are clear, it's, it's, either, it's easier to kind of take a deep breath and figure out how you're gonna get there. Second is mentors that help you evaluate periodically how you are doing along that path. Um, I would also uh, counsel you to find out whether a break in the tenure clock is permitted. Uh, COVID has actually increased this capability at many academic institutions, so that if you see yourself really needing to take a break because you're having a difficult time working, that you understand what your options are. Um, so again, for me, it's about a clear uh, path and uh, trying to just work your way through it, asking for assistance and feedback along the way. I know that doesn't make it easier to attain what you need to do, the writing of papers, the teaching of classes, the external visibility, but if you know what's needed, I, I think you're gonna do better at attaining it from my perspective. So, so maybe I'll take this one from a, the industry perspective. Um, so, one thing that we always, uh, that we used to do, I think, well at Genomic Health also was, um, I think back to my manager who would talk about how uh, you would be promoted when, when, um, when your manager felt like you would be successful in that new role, right? Not a promotion just for the sake of promotion, but 
um, the promotion such that you will be successful if you get if you're in that new role. And so um, part of that was not just doing really well as an individual contributor and just getting to the next level, but also at showing a leadership strengths. And a way one way to do that that they that they did well there too was leadership training. So um, if you feel like you want to get to that next role and maybe a leadership role where you have um, have uh, other skills that you want to build, maybe ask for those um, ask for training in those areas so that you feel better prepared when you get to that next level. Um, so yeah, I think that would be what I would I would suggest um, in order in, in addition to what Sally said, which was make sure you understand the expectations of that next level. And then if you feel uncomfortable with any aspects of that, you know, try to get try to find the right training to feel more comfortable. Nice. So this is going to be our last question, um, but I think it's an important one. So many of the the chat has sort of uh, touched on a lack of pro productivity despite heavy workload and time pressure, and then lots of meetings. And one question to the speakers is, how do you reduce meetings, prioritize tasks, and um, have good time management skills to make sure that you are meeting the needs of your job, but you're not, you're, you're balancing those needs effectively? Yeah, companies oftentimes struggle with the too many meetings. So oftentimes they actually have um, have uh, committees to focus on how to make, I, I think at every company I've been at, there has been how to make meetings more effective and how to reduce me. So a few things that I can remember off the top of my head that we've done is um, things like you have to have an agenda um, for every meeting, never have a meeting without an agenda. Another one is, if it's just updates, that can be done via email. Um, the meeting should be have at the very beginning some some question or decision that you're trying to get an answer to, and then have discussion around that. And if it's and if and all the updates should just be by email. That would be one one suggestion. And the other one that we used recently was um, they're called fast. I think they call fast meetings or something in Google Calendar, where um, it takes if it's a 30 minute meeting it takes five minutes off so it's like 25 me minute meeting um and then if it's a one hour meeting it takes 10 minutes off i think so it ends 10 minutes early so you can get from meeting to meeting or you have extra time um so i think those are a few like just i think it's just meeting hygiene um, more so than anything um and then um and then also not having meetings that are too big Right. So just only the critical players at a meeting so that there is actually active discussion. Um, a lot of times there will be folks who won't speak up and you really want them to speak up. And it's more difficult to speak up if there are a lot of uh, people in the meeting. So, yeah, meeting hygiene, I think, is the answer and just finding. Um, That's great. I, I, I was taking notes because we don't do all of that and we should. <laughs> I'm with you on the agendas, minutes, action items. Um, can really keep things um, moving forward. I would say, going back also to another part of the question about time management, periodically, I sit down and I review everything I'm doing. And I look at my calendar for the last month, last two months, I look at it and I say, what was not useful? What are all the things I'm doing? I make myself a list. I talk over that list with someone else and really try to take a step back and say, okay, um, I've done this actually with employees. We get a whiteboard. We just start making a list of everything you're doing, how much time it's taking, what meetings you're going to, and then just start to slash stuff. And as a manager, I'm often able to say, look, we got to get you out of that project. You cannot do it on top of everything else. Or these two projects, let's talk about which is the one that you should be doing right now, what's best for your career. And it's, it's often sad because you have to give up stuff, but I think it's really um, behooves all of us to kind of do this assessment of where we're spending our time. Now I would say time management isn't just about working harder, right? It's about working hopefully smarter and allowing yourself that time uh, to do the other things that you need to do, taking the walk, uh, taking the bike ride, as Tara said, or spending time with family and friends. 
So try that task, write everything down. If you can't fit it on a single piece of paper, that's maybe time to take a step back and help, have someone else help you after you've written it down to really help you look through things and try to make some decisions about what to cut. Oh, I just want to, before we like end, I just want to add to what Sally said. That's a great suggestion. And so in Google Calendar, what I do is I color code the blocks of time, and then you can get a summary based on the color code blocks of time um, to see where you're spending your time. And I do that by client. And then I also put in like the color codes for like the fun stuff. So that's green. All the personal time is green. And so I can see how much of my time is green versus the various clients. So that's one, one way to that's do it. That's great advice. I have a color coded calendar as well for that reason. I love it. Okay. Well, speaking of time management, we are out of time, but I do want to be respectful of everybody's time, but I can't let you go without acknowledging the people who have made this webinar possible. Um, thank you to our speakers, Dr. Morton, Dr. Madala, as well as to the Pathways to Promotion Committee and the San Francisco Bay Area Chapter of the American Statistical Association. They've been extremely helpful. Um, please